Consider this, a single, almost invisible speck of a potent drug, no larger than a grain of salt, left behind in a manufacturing tank. This tiny remnant could find its way into the next batch of medicine, a completely different drug intended for a different illness. For a patient, this microscopic contamination could lead to a severe allergic reaction, an unexpected side effect, or render their medication ineffective. This isn't just a hypothetical scenario, it's a real-world risk that the pharmaceutical industry must vigilantly manage. The stakes are incredibly high, involving not just the health of individuals, but the very trust we place in the medicines we rely on every day. It's a powerful reminder that in pharmaceuticals, what you can't see can definitely hurt you. This is where a crucial, often overlooked process comes into play cleaning validation. Think of it as the silent guardian of pharmaceutical manufacturing. It's the rigorous science-based process that proves a cleaning procedure consistently and effectively removes all traces of a previous product, cleaning agents, and any microbial life from the equipment. It's not enough to simply say something is clean. We must have undeniable proof. This guardian works behind the scenes, ensuring that every tablet, capsule, or injection is pure and safe, containing only what it is supposed to contain. It's a fundamental pillar of quality control that stands between a safe, effective medicine and a potential public health disaster. At its core, cleaning validation is a formal, documented program that establishes with a high degree of assurance that a specific cleaning process will consistently produce a result meeting predetermined specifications. The main purpose is twofold to prevent cross-contamination between different products and to eliminate any residues from cleaning agents themselves. By doing this, we protect patients from exposure to unintended active pharmaceutical ingredients, or APIs. A patient taking a simple painkiller should not be accidentally dosed with a powerful hormone or a cytotoxic drug used in cancer therapy. Cleaning validation provides the scientific evidence that our manufacturing environment is truly, verifiably clean, batch after batch. The importance of this process cannot be overstated. Imagine a facility that produces both a common blood pressure medication and a potent antibiotic. Without validated cleaning procedures, there's a tangible risk that trace amounts of the antibiotic could contaminate the blood pressure drug. A patient with a penicillin allergy could then have a life-threatening anaphylactic reaction to a medicine they have taken safely for years. This is precisely the kind of catastrophic event that cleaning validation is designed to prevent. It is the methodical, evidence-based assurance that the medicine you take is exactly what your doctor prescribed, free from any hidden and harmful stowaways from a previous production run. Cleaning validation isn't just a good manufacturing practice. It's a legal requirement enforced by regulatory bodies around the world. Organizations like the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the European Medicines Agency, and the Pharmaceutical Inspection Cooperation Scheme all have stringent regulations that mandate it. Why are they so insistent? Because they are tasked with protecting public health, and they know that unverified cleaning processes pose a direct threat. These agencies understand that without a formal validation program, a company has no objective proof that its equipment is safe for producing the next batch of medicine. Their guidelines are not suggestions. They are rules that carry the full weight of the law. When a regulatory inspector walks into a pharmaceutical plant, cleaning validation is always a major focus of their audit. They come prepared with a list of pointed questions designed to test the robustness of the company's program. An inspector might ask, how did you determine that this product is the worst case for your cleaning validation study? Or can you show me the scientific rationale for your acceptance limits for this residue? They will also demand to see the data, provide the validation reports, including all raw data from your sampling and analytical testing, for the last three successful validation runs. An inability to answer these questions with comprehensive, well-organized documentation can lead to serious consequences. These consequences can range from a formal warning letter, which is publicly available and can damage a company's reputation, to more severe actions. In critical cases, regulators can order a product recall, halt production at a facility, or levy substantial fines. The FDA, for example, has cited numerous companies for inadequate cleaning validation in its warning letters, often pointing to a lack of scientific justification for acceptance criteria or a failure to validate the cleaning of non-contact parts. 
These enforcement actions underscore a critical point. Regulatory bodies view cleaning validation as a non-negotiable component of ensuring drug safety and quality. Compliance is not optional. The ultimate goal of these regulations and inspections is to ensure that every pharmaceutical company has a system in place that is logical, scientifically sound, and consistently followed. They want to see that a company has thought critically about the risks involved. This includes identifying which products are hardest to clean, what residues are most toxic, and how to prove they have been removed to a safe level. The regulatory backbone exists to force a systematic approach, preventing companies from taking shortcuts or relying on assumptions. It ensures that the silent guardian of cleaning validation is not just present, but is also well-trained, effective, and always on duty. A successful cleaning validation program is built upon several key elements, each carefully considered and scientifically justified. The first step is equipment selection. Instead of testing every single piece of equipment, a common strategy is to group similar equipment together, like tanks of the same design but different sizes. The validation is then performed on the piece of equipment that is considered the most difficult to clean, often the one with the most complex internal geometry, like hard-to-reach valves or nozzles. This worst-case approach provides confidence that if the hardest piece can be cleaned, the simpler ones can too making the process more efficient without sacrificing quality. Next comes the selection of the worst case product. This is the product that is considered the most challenging to remove from the equipment surfaces. The determination is based on several factors. One is solubility. A product that is not very soluble in the cleaning agent will be harder to wash away. Another is potency or toxicity. Highly potent drugs require much lower, stricter cleaning limits because even a tiny amount of residue can be harmful. By validating the cleaning procedure using this most difficult product, the company can be confident that the same procedure will be effective for all other, easier to clean products made on the same equipment train. Once the worst case equipment and product are chosen, the company must establish clear and scientifically sound acceptance criteria. This means defining exactly what clean means in measurable terms. These limits are not arbitrary. They are typically calculated based on a combination of factors, including the therapeutic dose of the potential contaminant, its toxicity, and a safety factor. For example, a common approach is the 10 parts per million criterion, meaning no more than 10 parts per million of the previous product can be present in the next one. Another is the dose-based calculation which ensures that a patient receiving the next product would not be exposed to more than a tiny fraction, say, one one-thousandth, of a therapeutic dose of the previous product. Finally, the blueprint must detail the sampling plan and the analytical methods. You can't prove something is clean without taking a sample and testing it. The sampling plan specifies exactly where samples will be taken from, focusing on those hard-to-clean locations identified earlier, it also defines how the samples will be taken using methods like swabbing or rinsing. The analytical methods are the laboratory tests, like high-performance liquid chromatography, that will be used to measure the amount of residue in those samples. These methods must be incredibly sensitive, capable of detecting the residue down to the established low acceptance limits. Each of these elements forms a critical part of the overall validation blueprint. To prove that a piece of equipment is clean, you have to go looking for any potential residue left behind. This is done through meticulous sampling methods. The most common and direct method is swabbing. This involves using a special, low-lint swab to physically wipe a precise, defined area of the equipment surface, typically 10 cm by 10 cm. The locations chosen for swabbing are always the worst-case spots, places like corners, gaskets, or mixer blades where residue is most likely to accumulate. The swab is then taken to the lab, where any collected residue is extracted and analyzed. This method provides direct evidence of the cleanliness of a specific surface area. Another widely used sampling technique is the rinse method. This is particularly useful for large systems or enclosed pipework where swabbing is impractical. In this method, a known volume of a solvent, like purified water or another cleaning agent, is passed through the entire equipment train. A sample of this final rinse water is then collected and taken to the laboratory for analysis. 
The assumption is that any residue left on the equipment surfaces will dissolve into the rinse solvent. While less direct than swabbing, the rinse method gives a good overall picture of the cleanliness of the entire system, complementing the targeted data provided by swabs. Once samples are collected, they are analyzed using highly sensitive and specific analytical methods. The goal is to detect and quantify any residue with a high degree of accuracy. The most common technique is high-performance liquid chromatography, or HPLC, which is excellent at separating different chemical compounds and can detect very low concentrations of a specific drug substance. Another method is total organic carbon analysis, or TOC. This test doesn't identify specific compounds, but measures the total amount of carbon-based residue, making it a great general screening tool for both product residue and cleaning agent residue. The choice of method depends on the nature of the residue and the required sensitivity. All of this work, the rationale, procedures, sampling and testing, must be meticulously documented in a formal cleaning validation protocol. This document is the master plan. It clearly states the objective of the validation, defines the responsibilities of each team member, from production to quality control, and details the entire procedure step by step. It specifies the equipment being validated, the cleaning procedure being tested, the sampling locations, the analytical methods, and the pre-approved acceptance criteria. This protocol acts as the instruction manual for the validation exercise, and every step must be followed precisely and documented in real time. Even with the best laid plans, cleaning validation presents its share of challenges. One common hurdle is the variability of the cleaning process itself. Manual cleaning, in particular, can be inconsistent because it relies on the technique and diligence of individual operators. What one person considers a thorough scrub, another might not. This variability can lead to inconsistent validation results, making it difficult to prove the process is reliable. This is why many companies are moving towards automated clean-in-place or CIP systems, which offer much greater consistency and control over critical parameters like time, temperature, and chemical concentration, leading to more robust and repeatable results. Another significant challenge is the analytical side of the process. Sometimes, residues are very difficult to recover from surfaces, especially if they are sticky or insoluble. This can make sampling by swabbing or rinsing less effective, as the residue might not be picked up efficiently. Furthermore, developing an analytical method that is sensitive enough to detect residues at the incredibly low levels required by the acceptance criteria can be a complex and time-consuming task. The laboratory must prove not only that it can detect the residue but that its measurement is accurate and precise every single time, which requires extensive method validation in its own right. The requirement for thorough documentation can itself be a challenge. A cleaning validation program generates a massive amount of data, from the initial risk assessments and protocol development to the raw data from sampling and lab analysis, culminating in a final summary report. Every single piece of information must be recorded, reviewed and archived in a way that is clear, traceable and readily available for regulatory inspection, which could happen years later. Any gaps, missing signatures or unexplained deviations in the documentation can call the entire validation effort into question. Maintaining this level of documentary rigor requires discipline and robust quality systems. In conclusion, cleaning validation is far more than a box-ticking exercise. It is a fundamental responsibility for everyone working in the pharmaceutical industry. It is the science-backed promise that the medicine in one bottle is not tainted by the one made before it. From the process engineer who designs the cleaning cycle, to the operator who performs it, to the chemist who tests the samples, each person plays a vital role in upholding this standard. Ultimately, cleaning validation is the silent, steadfast guardian that ensures the integrity of our medicines, protects the health of patients, and maintains the public's trust in the pharmaceutical world. It's just good, clean science.